And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie Helms, who's the Executive Coordinator for the Washington Invasive Species Council, and she's going to provide some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Maria, and hello, everybody. Thank you all so much again for being here today. My name is Stephanie Helms, and I'm the Executive Coordinator to the Washington Invasive Species Council. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to Day 3 to Invasive Species Awareness Week, which Governor Jay Inslee proclaimed this week in solidarity with the national event. All around the United States, there are events and webinars happening to raise awareness and highlight simple actions that we can all take to stop and prevent the spread of invasive species. To put a dollar figure on it, the cost of damage, management, and control of invasive species amounts to over $1.2 trillion globally over the last 50 years. And that's just economically. We know that outside that dollar amount that invasive species harm nearly every aspect of our lives, including ecological and agricultural damage, impacts to native species, as well as loss of recreational opportunities. The good news is, is that we all have a role to play and have this unique opportunity to raise awareness, focus on prevention, and get involved and work together to protect all that we hold dear in Washington State. And with that, I wanna personally thank you all again for being here and let's all join together to thank our colleagues at Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife for joining us today for this webinar. And now I'll hand it over to Chelsea Buffington, European Green Crab Lead Biologist to kick off the European Green Crab Public Update webinar. Take it away, Chelsea. Thank you, Maria and Stephanie, for that introduction. And thank you all for your attendance during this webinar. It's great to see so many people in attendance to learn about this invasive species. My name is Chelsea Buffington, and I am the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Invasive Species Unit European Green Crab Project Lead. This is quite a mouthful. I am going to kick us off by giving a very brief overview of what we will be discussing today. <clears throat> Dr. Brian Turner, our research scientist, is going to be giving us some background on European green crab and why we care about this invasive species. He will also discuss some of the current status and trends uh, that we see here in Washington. Next, we will hear an overview of the European green crab emergency measures from Justin Bush, our aquatic invasive species policy coordinator and European green crab incident commander. Then you'll hear from me again on how various folks are getting involved and a quick introduction of the aquatic invasive species unit dedicated European green crab team. Then Lena Mohar, our European Green Crab Field Operations Lead Biologist, will then walk us through our team's field operations, support, and plans for 2024. We will then have an opportunity to hear from our regional biologists, Rachel Flannery and Lindsay Parker, about specific operations that have and will be taking place in their regions. Lena will also be acting as the Olympia-based regional biologist, as we are currently in the hiring process for that position. Then I'm going to wrap up by letting folks know how they can get involved, provide some outreach materials and resources, and then follow up with some time for questions. So thank you all very much. Excited to get started. And so, Brian, go ahead and take it away. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Chelsea, for introducing me. I'm seeing if I can get the slide. to it. There we go. Um, thanks again. Uh, my name is Brian Turner. I uh, always am happy to do um, this particular part of the talk because I often have to go really big picture and it's or a really small picture. It's nice to have a chance to talk, talk about European green crabs and identification and some of the baseline stuff to help set the stage. Um, so we'll start off basically by a little bit of the usual suspecting here. What exactly is a green crab? And so as you can see here, I've got six different images of green of crabs um, taken from the Washington Department, or sorry, the Wa uh, Washington State Sea Grant, Washington Sea Grants, sorry, one of those kind of days, um, identification, uh, pamphlet. And you might be thinking to yourself, Brian, this is hardly fair. You know, how can we tell if it's a green crab without the color? And Brian, how can we tell if it's a green crab without the size? And I will tell you that counting on size and color is not a great way to identify the European green crab. And so hopefully in this next couple of slides, you'll be able to know that in fact, the green crab was this one here down at the bottom. So as I mentioned before, Color is not a great way to identify the European green crab. It's unfortunate that's what it's called. Um, but green crabs can actually have a wide variety of colors. As adults, they can range from sort of this, uh, they can range from a uh, yellow green to a little bit of a blue, some darker yellows up to orange and red in coloration. Um, these little guys, you know, the juveniles you can see also can have kind of whitish coloration as well. So color is never really the best way. Sometimes you'll be right, but sometimes you'll be wrong to use color. Um, additionally, size is not the best. Green crabs grow up to about four inches wide, um, but they can also be confused um, at that smaller size for things like smaller dungeness, uh, smaller red rocks. Um, even smaller green crabs are about the same size as, say, uh, 
hairy shore crabs and things like that. So size alone is not another good uh, way to determine. What you do want to look for are the spines on the carapace. Uh, green crabs have a very distinct pattern. They have five on the side of their body. These are called carapace teeth or marginal teeth. Um, and then three of these bumps in between the eyes called rostral bumps. And so it gives them a distinct five, three, five pattern. So that's how you know it's a green crab. There's no other crab on this coast that has that kind of um, spine pattern. You can also look for their back legs tend to be a little flattened. They have that kind of narrow body. Um, but the, the bottom line is the spine count is the best way. And in fact, is a really a consistent, effective way to identify most crab species. Often I get asked, where did the green crabs come from? As their name suggests, they are primarily from Europe, but the range actually goes down to North Africa and up into places like Norway. Um, they've spread throughout the world. You can find them in Australia, South Africa, um, South America, and on both coasts of the United States. Most recently, there's been a couple of detect there's been detection of them in very far south of um, Alaska. So the range has expanded quite a lot um, over the years. There are areas where they've been introduced and shown up, popped up from time to time and not really become established, but they've gone a long way from their original range. No, why do we care, right? Uh, we can talk about the, the issue of green crabs, but it's always important to think about the context. Well, green crabs are really effective invaders because they have a really wide range of tolerances. They can handle a lot of uh, varieties of temperature and salinity. So they can survive in almost fresh water for short periods. Um, they can survive in very cold and very hot water or very warm waters. Um, and so that means there's a lot of places they can become established in. They also have a highly diverse diet. I always think of it as basically anything they can eat, they will eat. Um, so their diet ranges from things like primarily bivalves, so clams and mussels, to cra other crabs. Um, but they'll eat anything. They eat algae, they eat fish. They'll, again, anything they can, they will eat. Um, and they're highly reproductive, too. I'm not sure if folks can see my mouse, um, but, but if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see this green crab, which is orange in color with this very bright orange um, egg cluster. Um, there's about 180,000 eggs that are produced in each clutch of eggs for green crabs. That's a very rough estimate. They can be lower or higher, um, but about that. And of those, they can have a, a clutch more than once a year if the weather is warm enough, if they have sufficient food, if conditions are right. Um, and the little picture here of a thing that looks a little bit like a gray alien is actually their barbite. So they, they look very different when they're born from when they uh, become adults. We uh, also know quite a bit about what green crabs impact, but a lot of what we know, we also kind of have to infer from what we've been able to prove. So for example, it's well known that, gre that uh, green crabs impact hairy shore crabs. This cute little guy here at the top row, um, that's the hairy shore crab or Hemigrapsis organensis. They're very common here in Washington, as well as along the Pacific coast. Um, and there's been lots of studies, including ones I've performed where green crabs will eat these guys really effectively. Uh, they're very popular food for them. Um, and so it's it's considered that if they are consuming these small crabs, it's very likely they could be consuming other small crab species or younger individuals for other crab species. So uh, things like juvenile dungeness are a big concern and more research needs to be done into what kind of impacts are happening, but it is feasible that green crabs could be impacting them. Additionally, green crabs have had a huge impact on eastern softshell clams on the east coast of the United States. They're basically held responsible for one of the big fisheries collapses. And they green crabs eat thin-shelled um, clams and mussels and things like that. Um, and so even though uh, it's an eastern, uh, eastern coast species, you can find these uh, clams, my arenaria, here in Washington. They're farmed and harvested. Um, but we also expect that green crabs are going to have impacts on other similar species or um, the young of other tougher species, like things like manila clams and oysters. So again, there's not as much evidence or research done on those, but more needs to be done to really establish and understand what kind of impacts green crab are having. Um, lastly, green crabs are known to impact eelgrass beds. They can reduce the size, they dig them up, they eat root shoots, things like that. Um, and so there's a lot of other organisms that are related to eel, that, um, you know, use eelgrass as, as um, uh, nursery habitat. 
utilize it for food. And so there's a big concern that any impact green crabs are going to have on the eelgrass, it's going to have a cascading effect to impact other species as well. So enough about what green crabs are. Let's talk about where they are in Washington. So first off, I want to say that Washington is a big place and with a lot of coastline. And so we had to start off, but and by I want to stress that a lot of what I'm going to be showing and talk, talking about here, while I represent WDFW, um, the work that's being done statewide is done by a number of uh, co-managers, tribes, and partners without whom we would be nowhere near as effective as we've been. This is really a statewide communal effort. This is not just WDFW on this. Um, and so we've split Washington into two halves, the Salish Sea branch, which includes um, most of the Salish Sea, the more Puget Sound area, and the coastal branch, which is on the, uh, the more uh, uh, Pacific coastal areas. Each of those branches is subdivided into 14 management areas and then further subdivided into coordination areas, sites, and subsites. I'm not going to list them all because you don't need you don't need to waste your time on that right now, but it's really helpful for us in terms of coordinating and understanding and keeping track of what's going on. In terms of these management areas, nine of the 14 have had green crab detection since we've been monitoring, um, as denoted by these little green crabs I've put here on the map. Um, this table here on the left you'll see is showing the total number or showing the green crabs removed from the Salish Sea Branch, the Pacific Coast Branch, and the total green crabs removed uh, from the state of Washington for each year from 1998 to 2022. Uh, one thing I really want to stress is that um, these numbers are not reflective of effort. That's to say, we were not putting as much work into removing green crabs in 1999 as we are currently. And so it should not, it's not, this is partially a reflection of increased numbers of green crab, but it's also a reflection of a lot more effort being put into finding and removing them. Um, but the bottom line is green crab numbers in the state and are, uh, the numbers being removed have increased dramatically since their first introduction in the late 90s. And in particular, in the last few years, there's been huge effort uh, by all involved to remove as many green crabs as possible. What I have here is a graph showing um, the green crab removed from the two branches, again, the coastal and the Salish Sea branch, um, from the beginning of 2022 to the end of 2023. This is the duration for the current uh, green crab emergency that's going on. And this is when um, activity involved remo for removing green crab really uh, sped up across the state. Um, the y-axis here is just showing the number of green crab removed. And on the x-axis, we have uh, a unit I'm calling duration. Uh, part of the complication is when we were collecting information from all the various um, tri uh, co-managers, tribes, and partners throughout the state, we sort of lumped communally the first uh, six months into our public reports. I should mention these are all from uh, uh, reports that we put out for folks. Um, and so the first bar is representing six months of data. After that, each bar represents one month of data. Uh, main thing I want to show in terms of the Salish Sea, that's the graph on the right, is that there has been a dramatic decrease in the number of green crab uh, being collected within the Salish Sea. Um, I should say that the biggest sort of hot spot for green crabs during that time was um, Lummi Sea Pond. A lot of effort was put in and there's been really dramatic reductions um, in that location um, thanks to all the hard work that's been going on. And so it's a really positive um, uh, change, but there are still green crab present in lots of locations in the Salish Sea and our trapping efforts and monitoring are still ongoing. Um, the coastal range, it's a little more up and down. There's some seasonal shifts and transitions. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of the specifics today. I will say that multiple locations within um, the coastal branch have shown declines in green crab numbers in 2023 since 2022, but there's also been an increase in the amount of effort that's going in. So part of this uh, larger num catch number we see in 2023 is reflective of a lot more effort, a lot more traps being deployed, a lot more um, uh, work days being put in to deal with this. Um, when our data is showing, there's actually some decline in green crab numbers. We have had a few new detections of green crabs this year um, to kind of orient you to this graph, this map here. Um, any site that is blue um, is going to be a new site. So that is to say, 
there are green crabs relatively close by to this location, but this specific spot, it's new. Red is for a new coordination area, which is to say um, a the green crabs are further away, but uh, still not a, not a complete shock that we would find them somewhere nearby. And then management area is, this is a complete larger swath of the state uh, where green crabs have not been detected. Though I should note um, for the two orange points we have, which are Salt Creek and Nia Bay, up here in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, both of them are actually pretty close to other uh, detections of green crabs, so it's not as shocking um, that we would find them. Um, the point that I want to make here is that we've been putting in a lot of work over the last few years monitoring for these uh, green crab, and we are still finding them in new locations. This is indicative of a couple of things. There could be some continued spread, and there's also the fact that um, some of these were detected in locations where we had already looked. And so there's a real need to, to think carefully about how we do monitoring, um, how much effort's being put in, and thinking about the limitations of the approaches and um, the uh, resources that we have. Because it's not just a good enough to say, this one time we didn't detect green crab, therefore there's no way they're there. When there is evidence to suggest in some of these locations, they may have been present but not detected during our initial attempts. Um, but that just reinforces that more effort is needed and more monitoring is needed to ensure that we are detecting them. Lastly, I wanted to show you this figure. This is kind of a very broad summary of what happened in 2023. Um, in this map, each dot represents roughly a location where we trapped. I say roughly because for some uh, for some commanders, tribes, and partners, I've had there's some requests to you know not have a specific location but a little more generalized. Some sites are combined, some are moved a little bit, but this is a pretty good reflection of what happened um, over the course of the year. About 360,000 green crab were caught, uh, more than 176,000 traps were checked um, at more than 150 locations. Any one of these dots that is blue is a location where trapping happened, but no green crabs were detected. And red is a location where trapping happened and green crab were detected. So what we see here is a high concentration of detections in places like Grays Harbor, Willow Bay, and at the northern uh, coast of Washington. These are areas where green crab were first detected, long established, It's um, and they are pretty well set in. If you look into the Salish Sea, we do have green crab detections, but there is large swaths of Washington that are uninvaded. And as, um, to the best of our ability, they have not, there's no evidence of any presence. Um, what I wanna stress through this is that green crabs are still an emergency and they're still worth the effort and concern that we have, but there are there is good news too, in that there are a lot of areas in which they don't seem to be present. In the areas where there are present, we're seeing some optimistic signs that there can be some local reductions from trapping. And overall, an issue of concern, uh, but there's no strong evidence of any huge explosion or any uh, massive increase that's happened. We will say that next year, or this coming year, is going to be an El Nino year, which tend to be paired with high years of recruitment. And so we want to ensure we're doing um, sufficient monitoring and uh, control efforts to um, to be able to detect and deal with this potential increased recruitment. And I think that's all for me. Yep. So I'll pass this along then to Justin. Great. Well, thank you, Brian. Wonderful job. And I agree. We have some really great signs of early success. Um, and we have a lot to celebrate with over 360,000 crabs caught in large areas uninfested. What we're doing is working and I'm feeling very positive about that. Hi everyone and happy Invasive Species Awareness Week. My name is Justin Bush and I'm the Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Invasive Species Policy Coordinator. I'm responsible for aquatic invasive species prevention and management as well as regulation, including ballast water and biofouling. And I have the honor of being the state's European Green Crab Incident Commander. So I'm gonna give a, a status update on the overall emergency today. Wanted to start off by providing a little bit of context. The state legislature has made the Department of Fish and Wildlife the lead state agency for managing invasive species in the animal kingdom. The area that we focus on that we're gonna be talking about today are primarily on aquatic invasive species. But just wanted to acknowledge that while the State Department of Fish and Wildlife is the lead state agency, 
we can't be successful alone. Our authorities do not apply to tribal lands or federal lands, and invasive species don't respect jurisdictional boundaries. Invasive species often are a landscape issue that will spread from one jurisdiction to another. And for us to be successful in preventing and stopping invasive species, we must also work across those same jurisdictional boundaries. Wanted to think a little bit about the generalized invasion curve. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with early detection and rapid response best practices, wanted to spotlight this really helpful resource that the Washington Invasive Species Council created. And what I wanted to point out that there are areas of our state that we just saw Dr. Turner speak to where we can still prevent European green crab establishment. We can do that through regulations. We can do that through simple actions to avoid spreading the species. In other areas where they're just getting established, we have a point where we have small localized populations and site-specific eradication is possible. We have seen very successful signs of containment activities. And then when populations are very well established, we think about containment as well as asset-based protection. And where there's high European green crab numbers, we're confident that a high level of effort will reduce that population to a point where we will have ongoing management to keep the population down uh, for the long term. So in the state of Washington, new invasive species are widely considered to be an environmental and economic emergency. And aquatic invasive species are no different. Within the state Department of Fish and Wildlife's authorities, there is the ability to seek emergency measures if the Department of Fish and Wildlife Director finds there is an imminent danger of a prohibited level one, the highest priority like European green crab, or level two species that threatens or endangers our environment, our economy, human health, or the well being of Washington. And that's exactly what we've done in the case of European green crab. We are implementing emergency measures. And in the state of Washington, there's a clear expectation that when we respond to emergencies, we will use an internationally accepted um, procedure in order to uh, mobilize the response and maintain communication, situational awareness, and then also control. And that's using the incident management system. So in, in, January, in January 19th of 2022, Governor Jay Inslee responded to what you saw in the data is that European green crop populations were rapidly expanding. We then took efforts to mobilize the entire state under the governor's emergency order with the Department of Fish and Wildlife as a lead state agency to respond. And this is what we've done since that time. We don't do this alone. We use systems that have been established in the incident command system to coordinate with other jurisdictions, whether they're tribal jurisdictions, federal agencies, academic institutions, local organizations, regional agencies. It's, it, we've really mobilized all the different organizations that have some role or resources toward this common European green crop problem. And when we look at the success we've had, much of it can be attributed to this overall system and the way that it performs. It's a, it's a proven system that works for any, any emergency of any type, planned or, or unplanned. In addition to mobilizing those organizations, Governor Jay Inslee also requested funds from our state legislature to respond. And that has provided over $12 million per biennium and wanted to give a quick overview of how that funding is being used. When I say the Department of Fish and Wildlife can't do it alone, I mean it. You can see that reflected in our funding. We are passing funds through to tribes and other partners to assist our efforts. So we're able to set the framework of how to respond across the entire landscape, set objectives that are shared by all organizations, and then work together to then implement the effort toward achieving those objectives. I feel like we're on track and I feel like what Brian Turner just shared in terms of the positive things that we're starting to see, I think that this is saying that we're on the right track. We're not there yet, we need to keep going, but feeling very positive today. 
wanted to highlight when I say that all organizations are harmonized toward their response, that's number one, the objectives would be to facilitate the Department of Fish and Wildlife implementing governor's emergency proclamation with respect for tribal sovereignty as well as federal jurisdictions. We realize that this work can be very hazardous and we're in some very difficult areas using heavy equipment in some cases and health and safety of all participants is, is a key thing in everyone's minds. Our goal is to reduce or contain European green crop populations below levels that can result in economic, environmental, or cultural harm. I realize we haven't fully answered the question about what those levels are, but we're starting to answer those questions through a research task force that and some of the information that Brian is able to compile over the past two years. We are striving for a transparent and collaborative emergency management. That's by having all the organizations that have a role in this together, sharing information, creating open dialogue, and then adapting. Something at this scale uh, that of this complexity really hasn't been done in invasive species before. And I'm very proud of everyone's efforts and the success that we've had. And a lot of that is by having this transparent and collaborative process. And then thinking about the future, we're thinking a lot about the post-emergency transition to long-term management with the Department of Fish and Wildlife Oversight. We will always have our responsibility as a lead state agency, but we want to empower our co-managers, tribes, and partners with the tools so that they can take on long-term ownership and success in uh, um, reaching our objectives. I feel like we're doing that, but much of that is unfolding currently as we develop a six-year long-term management plan. So with that, I thank you all for your time today and I'll pass it back to Chelsea Buffington. Thanks, Justin. Hi again, everyone. Now we're gonna briefly touch on how people are getting involved and who the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's European Green Crab team is. As Justin alluded to with the European Green Crab Incident Command System Management Strategy Organization chart earlier, the European Green Crab Emergency Response is quite complex and there are a lot of different moving parts. We get asked a lot, who is doing what and where and how do I get involved? As you can see on the slide, there are many different co-managers, tribes, and partners currently involved in European green crab management across the state of Washington. Since green crab extend beyond jurisdictional boundaries, management responses require strong collaboration, coordination, and communication between all the various groups. In addition, management types, priorities, and goals, operations, resources, and capacities can differ between the various co-managers, tribes, and partners involved. At this time, our priority is to work with our co-managers, tribes, and partners through continued collaboration, onboarding, and support. It takes a lot of effort to build up local and long-term management foundations, so that has been our primary focus. However, anyone can get involved through other means, and I'll touch on this more at the end of the presentation today, but wanted to plug that there are opportunities through the Washington Sea Grant Crab Team. They have a monthly monitoring network that is active from April to September, and last year they launched a new molt search program that anyone can participate in. So now on to what Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Invasive Species Unit um, and who we are. Earlier, Justin touched on the fact that the department is the lead agency for managing invasive species of the animal kingdom statewide. Our unit works to protect Washington's environmental, economic, and human resources by preventing the introduction of new, controlling the spread of existing, and eradicating locally established aquatic invasive species, animal species. Our unit is charged with planning, coordinating, and leading the implementation of management actions on state lands. In addition, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife co-managers, consults, or provides assistance to tribal and federal agencies when requested. Now, when I started back in 2018, I was the sole green crab technician, but now we have more than 26 dedicated staff, and you're meeting many of them today. We are stationed around Washington State in Bellingham, LaConnor, Olympia, Port Townsend, Montesano, and Ocean Park. We would not be where we are today without this increase in effort and the support we received from the department, the governor, legislature, co-managers, tribes, and partners, and folks such as yourselves. And so I'm just going to go quickly through some slides. Um, we have a little bit of time here, and so want to introduce the team that is not here currently. And so, as you know, there's several of us that are here today. And so we have Justin, 
that you met. Jesse Schultz is also part of our prevention unit. He's our section lead. And then you just heard from Brian, myself, and you will hear from Lena next. You're also gonna hear from Lindsay and she has a team of four up in the Northern region. Um, and Brianne McNamara and Micah Mitchell are two of our current staff. And we are currently hiring for two additional positions in that area. We also have a vacant position coming soon um, for the regional biologist based out of Olympia. And currently we have two positions filled um, from Chris Pike and Emily Amos. And we have four that we are currently hiring for this work as well. And lastly, we have, last but not least, we have Rachel Flannery out on the coast and we have Hannah and Megan, sorry, Hannah Robinson and Megan Bungum that are our year round technicians. And we have Caden and Caden Cody and Brian Vilicic that will be starting back up soon. And again, we have two vacant positions on the coast. So if you're interested in those, we are happy to provide the postings for that as well. And now I'm gonna kick it off to Lana. <laughs> thank you, Chelsea. Um Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. Um, like Chelsea said, my name is Lana Shakri Mohar, and I'm the European Green Crab Field Operations Biologist. It's my job to oversee the execution or the actual doing of WDFW's management actions for green crab. So I'd like to show you what we have in mind to manage green crab populations in Washington waters. First off, how does how do we approach green crab management? Uh, we use baited traps set as, uh, as a mechanical tactic to remove green crabs from the system. So here's a picture of baited minnow and folding fish traps that we use. Uh, traps are set at a specific minimum distance apart to ensure independence from each other. As you can see the spacing on this map, each red dot is a trap that follows a channel. Usually we set traps at a low tide as well to make sure that the traps are partially covered in water to protect any need of bycatch. We also modify the traps to reduce the risk of unintended bycatch like mammals or larger fish and commercial sized dungeness crabs. Historically, we've always set traps by foot, hiking out to the marsh, carrying the traps on our backs. But as our team has grown and new skills and experienced staff are brought on, we've begun using boats more often in our efforts. So in the past, trapping efforts were really focused on early detection and assessment since we didn't really know what was going on with the green crab populations in Washington. If we knew there were green crabs, we didn't have a very good idea of their extent like on the coast. So efforts were more early detection focused and state and assessments focused statewide. We did do some rapid response efforts responding to green crab detections like in Drayton Harbor in 2019, but overall capacity was severely limited. But as more green crabs have been captured over the years, it became evident that more uh, action was needed. So resources were increased, which then increased trapping effort, which then increased detections, which then increased uh, the need for more resources, eventually leading to the governor's proclamation that Justin mentioned that brings us to today. So now that we have a strong foundation, as uh, Chelsea showed us earlier, we can focus on systematic repeated efforts across Washington waters to help us answer questions about what the green crab populations are doing over time and how they're impacted by management efforts. So as uh, Brian mentioned earlier, uh, green crab management, uh, for green crab management, Washington is split into two management branches, coastal and Salish Sea. And so we're approaching green crab management slightly differently in each branch due to the fact that we're essentially dealing with two different invasions. As shown earlier, there is already a large number of co-managers, tribes, and partners conducting removal efforts on the coast. And we recognize that DFW doesn't have the capacity to match or exceed those efforts, but there is still a need to understand how the removal efforts are impacting the green crab populations. So moving forward, we're focusing on piloting long-term monitoring efforts across uh, at, at specific sites across the coast. And these sites are set up so that supplemental trapping can happen alongside with monitoring efforts. There's also gonna be a huge focus on collaborative efforts with our trapping co-managers, tribes, and partners on the coast. On the inland side of things though, um, there's still a number of co-managers, tribes, and partners who are trapping for green crab, but they're also more spread out across a wider area. So while inland operations will also pilot long-term monitoring and coordinate collaborative efforts, 
there's still going to be a really big focus on doing early detection in, in areas where green crabs haven't yet been detected, um, performing assessments where green crabs may have been captured before, but we want an updated snapshot of their population, and conducting rapid and emphasis responses to new detections or increases in population or capture numbers. And so we also understand that trapping like only captures a subset of the green crabs out there. It only captures the adults and the juveniles large enough to be caught by our traps. We still have other life stages that are being missed, like the larval stages and juveniles post and pre-settlement. Um, so these methods that can be used to detect these life stages can include light traps and plankton toes and environmental DNA sampling. However, there still needs to be a lot to be done to develop the protocols behind these methods. But as that happens, we hope to incorporate those methods, you know, to supplement the trapping we've already been doing. And so for 2024, like we recognize, you know, green crabs don't live in a vacuum. And so green crab managers maybe shouldn't work in one either. And so we're committed to continue to collaborate with co-managers, tribes, and partners. Uh, usually this collaboration looks like joint trapping efforts. But it can also take the form of WDFW providing trapping gear to those who are just beginning to manage green crab or training those who are interested in starting green crab management. This rough map I have here on the right shows where DFW and local co-managers, tribes, and partners have agreed on collaborative efforts or hope to create collaborative efforts. Some of these collaborations can be regular ongoing events like once a month, twice a month or so. Some of them can be once or twice a season. It's really dependent on the uh, priorities of our local co-managers, tribes, and partners, um, what the green crab population looks like in the area, and the capacity of all parties involved. Um, and so with that, we will dive a little bit deeper into the regional operations with our regional bios, starting first with Rachel. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Flannery, and I'm the Coastal European Green Crab um, Regional Biologist. Um, my job is to coordinate and supervise scientific technicians um, to get them in the mud um, trapping for green crabs um, out on the coast. I also um, collaborate and coordinate with our coast um, co-managers, tribes, and partners with their trapping efforts. Um, and so just to kind of um, start us off, I wanted to bring us back um, to the past to give you a little um, snapshot of what um, the coast looked like. Um, starting in 1998, um, we had our first detections of green crab in Willapa Bay and in Grace Harbor. Um, and so even though there was an initial um, management response that took place during this time, um, during these discoveries, but um, there was a lack of evidence of self-recruitment and some funding constraints. Um, so the project was disbanded after a few years. Um, I wanted to flash forward to 2018. Um, we continued to see an increase of green crab detections and abundance, um, as well as an increase of a geographic range for the green crab throughout the Salish Sea and coastal waters, um, which prompted um, some collaborative efforts between WDFW and Sea Grant to do some um, trapping efforts in 2020 and in 2021. Um, and even with the limited capacity and resources and COVID happening, um, we were still able to get out in the mud and do some green crab assessment trapping um, in Willapa Bay, Grace Harbor, Copalis, um, and as well as in the Columbia. Um, and so by 2022, uh, we were able to increase our field staff by hiring um, some dedicated technicians trapping on the coast, um, some of them who even were able to transition out of a career seasonal position to a year round position um, to continue our trapping efforts um, into the fall and winter months. Um, and then I just wanted to point out the maps that I put on the slide. Um, on the left, it shows um, efforts um, from 2020 to 2021, and then on the right for 2022 um, in Copalis, Grace Harbor, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay, and the Columbia. Um, the yellow dots show um, a trap that did not catch a green crab, and the red dots um, represent traps that did catch a green crab. Um, and so uh, I really wanted to just highlight this to just show that in 2020 and 2021, our focus was much more broad to get a better idea of where these crabs are and what densities. Um, and then in 2022, we were able to kind of more narrow in um, on some specific sites um, as we were able to 
um, have more co-managers, tribes, and partners expand their own um, trapping capabilities. Um, and so I also wanted to chat about what we were up to in the year of 2023. Um, so in 2023, we were able to collaborate and work with some of our awesome co-managers, tribes, and partners on the coast um, to include Pacific and Grace Harbor Conservation Districts, the Shoalwater Bay Indian Tribe, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the Washington Department of Natural Resources, as well as the Willapa and Grays Harbor Oyster Growers Association members, um, and many more. Um, the photo down um, kind of at the bottom underneath my bullet points um, actually shows Hannah, our ocean park technician, um, on an airboat um, with some uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, members. They did a collaborative trapping effort, so that was really cool for them to be able to do. Um, we also piloted some long-term monitoring sites in Willapa Bay. Um, which are um, sites that we would trap at least once a month with, um, at the same location with the same number of trap types. Um, I'll touch on a little bit more um, about those regular trapping efforts later. Um, we also did periodic trapping efforts in the Columbia River, um, which it's encouraging to see that we had a consistent low catch in 2023. Um, and at one of our sites, we didn't have um, any green crab removed at all. Um, we also trained um, more of our technicians to be able to operate our watercraft safely um, to do more boat-based trapping efforts um, as well. And then um, we increased our technician staff from four in 2022 to six um, in 2023. Um, so because of that increase, we were actually able to um, just about triple our trap sets um, from that from year to year, which was really great to see. Um, and then just to highlight, you'll see um, this map on the right here, just with different, pointing out different areas of Washington. Um, but just to kind of give you a scope of what it's look, uh, what it's uh, focusing on um, is um, here we have total green crab, which is stands for CAMA, um, Carcinus Manus, um, caught per management area, and the total number of traps, trap sets over the course of last year as well as the catch per unit effort or CPUE, um, which is the number of crabs caught um, and every 100 traps. Um, so this map really breaks down um, how much green crab we were able to pull out in Grace Harbor, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay and the Columbia River um, for the entirety of the 2023 season. And then my last slide that I have prepared for you guys is what we're going to be doing in 2024. Um, so um, Chelsea briefly mentioned that we are in fact hiring and I believe she dropped in the chat um, links to those postings as well. So we're looking to hire two more to get started in April. Um, we also, we want to plan on continue doing our long-term monitoring sites in Willapa Bay, um, but we're also going to be adding more sites um, in the Columbia, Grace Harbor, and possibly Copalis. Um, the goal behind these long-term monitoring sites is that um, our technicians will set a fixed number of different trap types at each site um, at least once a month to collect um, consistent data over time. Um, and these sites were selected to complement the current um, Washington Sea Grant Sentinel sites with the CRAB team, um, which have a similar uh, trap setting and frequency protocol. Um, we also have plans to incorporate more boat-based trapping efforts, um, and we also plan to somehow coincide them with our long-term monitoring sites as well. Um, and we look forward to continue uh, on collaborating with our coast managers, tribes, and partners um, for another fun, fun year. Looking forward to 2024. But with that, I want to pass it off to Lindsay. Perfect. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Lindsay Parker and I am the Regional European Green Crab Biologist responsible for the North and North Central Puget Sound Management Areas, which is basically everything north of Everett, including the San Juan Islands. I have been working as a part of the Aquatic Invasive Species Unit since 2020. I'm based out of Bellingham and I also supervise our Bellingham-based crew of technicians and assist quite a bit with our Lucaner crew as well. As it was mentioned before, our first two inland detections of European green crab in Washington both happened in the North Puget Sound management area, which were on San Juan Island and at Padilla Bay in 2016. In 2020, huge efforts were made to hire staff, including myself, to help set up systematic control in Drayton Harbor, which is one of the hotspots at the time. 
um, and really expand our early detection efforts in North Puget Sound, despite the uphill battle of COVID restrictions and wildfires that were happening at the time. Since then, our team has continued to grow as we have built relationships with co-managers, tribes, and partners. Also in the area, Lummi Nation was one of the instrumental co-managers, tribes, and partners that helped sound the alarm about increasing European green crab numbers and helped get the governor's emergency proclamation in 2022. I've included a snapshot of one of the live dashboards from our public European green crab hub we can find statewide European green crab capture numbers broken down by management area, which is updated monthly. Since 2022, no live European green crab have been captured from the North Central management area, but almost 87,000 European green crab have been removed from North Puget Sound waters. In 2022, just over 80,000 European green crab were removed from this region. And even with increased efforts in 2023, our numbers dropped down to just over 6,000, which is really great to see such a big shift in the numbers. The main priority for my team this last season was assisting our co-managers, tribes, and partners who are working on controlling hotspots in the area, such as Lummi Nation and Northwest Straits Commission. Uh, none of that data is shown on this map on the slide. Um, but in addition to that um, assistance, we were able to do some targeted assessments and remove another 63 European green crowd from the North Puget Sound. We did have one new detection site at Post Point in Bellingham Bay and did see an uptick in captures in Birch Bay. Um, one thing to note, is that while no live European green crab were found in North Central Puget Sound uh, this year, one dead crab was found on Whidbey Island just north of where crabs had been found in 2018. Um, but additional follow-up efforts in the area found no more European green crab. Looking forward into our 2024 season, our number one priority in this region really continues to be our collaboration with co-managers, tribes, and partners. This includes Lummi Nation, Northwest Straits Commission, Department of Natural Resources, and Padilla Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. We are also looking at kicking off a technical working group in this region uh, to help these partners and shellfish growers in the area um, continue collaborating. This year, we will also be piloting long-term monitoring efforts in areas where we're currently finding European green crab in numbers, such as Drayton Harbor, Birch Bay, Post Point, and Chuckanut Bay. But we will continue to look at new sites uh, and go back to previous assessment sites to confirm that there are no unknown hotspots happening in the region. And I know Chelsea mentioned it earlier, but also wanted to give that plug that we are currently hiring for a two Bellingham based and one Laconer based technician in this area. So if this work sounds interesting to you and you want to get your boots in the mud with us, I would highly encourage you applying. And with that, I'll hand it back to Lena. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, it's me again. Uh, like Chelsea said, we are wrapping up hiring for our new, hopefully new, uh, Salish Sea Regional Bio, so I'm filling in for now. Um, Lindsay gave a really great intro to green crab population or de uh, detections in the Salish Sea. So if the slide wants to advance, there we go. Oh. So Along with those detections that Lindsay mentioned earlier, we also had one in 2017 on Dungeness Spit within the Dungeness National Wildlife Refuge managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and though this was a fairly small population, at the time it was the largest population of green crabs found within inland Washington waters. Um, and so it was a concerning source population for other nearby bays and estuaries. Um, and then, um, since that time, you know, uh, really since Chelsea began in 2018, WDFW was conducting early detection trapping efforts throughout the Salish Sea, beginning with just one technician, so Chelsea, for a couple of years, which then increased to two technicians in 2020 through 2022, 
And now we have a dedicated one regional biologist and six technicians dedicated to the rest of the Salish Sea. Um, this, uh, and so in 2022, we did have a new detection within Hood Canal. Um, and we were, uh, WDFW was able to put on a rapid response effort um, in the Seabeck area to better assess what the populations were, what green crab were doing in the area. And what that information kind of helped um, inform what we would do uh, in 2023, which I'll go over in just a little bit. Um, but I wanted to showcase like, uh, this is a map um, of the Sea Grant uh, crab team uh, monitoring sites. They've been uh, doing an amazing job. This map is great and really showcases where green crabs have been caught in the Salish Sea from the beginning since 2016 through 2022. This map in particular shows the um, detections of green crabs in the Salish Sea since, 2020, uh, since 2016. And so um, we can put a link in the chat for folks to look at this map as well and look at some of the data that's in there. Um, so, and so when it comes to 2023, like I said, last year um, was the largest staffing we've had for the Salish Sea region. And it's evident in the effort that was conducted. Um, so if you look at this map on the right here, these tables for the Eastern Street Admiralty Inlet, Western Street and Hood Canal coordination areas, um, they show the trapping in general terms of trapping effort that we were able to put into the Salish Sea area. So here we have a uh, total crabs uh, or CAMA, uh, top line short for carcinus manus, um, caught per management area. Uh, then the total number of trap sets over the course of last year, and then the catch per unit effort, which is the number of crabs caught in every 100 traps. Um, overall, the trap sets in the Salish Sea in 2023 was seven times the number of traps set in 2022. Um, and that's really because we had a really strong, really large, really strong team putting in a lot of effort. Um, that last year also included a lot of collaborations with the Suquamish tribe, uh, Jamestown Squalum tribe, Skokomish Indian tribe, Washington Department of Natural Resources, Macaw tribe, and Lower Elwha Squalum tribe. Um, and with the, some of these collaborations, we also had some new detections. So uh, the new detections in the Hood Canal um, being the Linger Longer Tidelands, Wright Smart Cove, Thorndike Bay, and the Seabed Conference Center in the Hood Canal. Um, these are all relatively near where green crab have already been detected. So these detections aren't super surprising to us, kind of some, similar to what Brian said earlier today. Um, however, the detections in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, so Adiz Lagoon in the Eastern Strait um, and Salt Creek on the Western Strait, these have happened in areas that haven't had as much historical effort, and thus they highlight the need to conduct more assessments in those areas to understand what the green crab populations look like. Um, other highlights from this past season include the new detection that happened at Salt Creek, where the Coastal Watershed Institute made the initial detection and reported that green crab that they found through three different ways. They used iNaturalist, the Washington Invasive Species app, and the WW, WDFW AIS hotline. And those three reporting techniques ensured that we saw the report that very same day. And we were able to set up a response the very next week, just within a few days of the original sighting. Um, I also wanted to highlight the increased effort in Hood Canal. Um, overall, uh, specifically the Seabeck area, which is where the uh, first detection Hood Canal happened last year in May of 2022. So in 2023, um, we were able to do eight separate trapping efforts at multiple sites in that area across the season. Um, so it led to about 1,600 trap sets and 99 green crabs captured overall. And so we've seen that with increased effort, we also have increased capture. Um, this just highlights the need that, you know, uh, we could use, you know, more local co-managers, tribes, and partners to help participate in management efforts. And so, you know, if you are an organization that's interested in getting involved with green crab management, um, I highly recommend you reach out to our AIS hotline so that uh, we connect and can take the next steps from there and assess, you know, how best um, that can fit in. So moving forward for 2022, um, like we kind of said earlier, we will be piloting long-term monitoring in the rest of the Salish Sea, mostly in the Hood Canal and also in Discovery Bay coordination area where crabs have been being captured you know, on a regular basis with efforts there. Um, it, so, 
and we're doing this because it'll be good to keep an eye on these populations and see how they change over time alongside removal efforts. Um, the Sailor Sea team will also be involved in collaborative efforts with some of our co-managers, tribes, and partners from last year, and hopefully new ones this year. There are several entities who have already contacted us interested in getting trained to manage green crab and some that wish to start trapping in their management areas, um, even if green crab haven't been detected there yet, to at least start with baseline data um, before any green crabs get established. Another large component of the Sailor Sea team will be to continue early detection efforts in areas that either haven't been trapped or haven't yet had green crab detection, uh, to conduct assessments in areas that may have had green crab but need follow-up, and to conduct rapid responses to a new detection or an emphasis response. An emphasis response is very similar to rapid responses, but it may be delayed in the timing of execution um, due to a number of factors. It all is very, um, uh, base, it's very situational. Um, but then finally, as we develop the protocols needed to use the additional detection methods, like the light traps, the plankton toes, environmental DNA, our Salish Sea team can look forward to piloting those as well alongside with our trapping efforts. And to wrap up our operations, just want to show you guys a snapshot of all of our trapping effort from 2023 in this map here on the right. Um, so again, uh, CAMA being the total number of green crabs captured in the management area, the effort being the number of traps set throughout the entire season, and CPUE is the catch per unit effort or the number of green crabs per 100 traps. Um, 18 out of 14 management areas had WDFW led at trapping efforts. And this does not include the efforts that were led by our co-managers, tribes, and partners that we also assisted in or supported um, that could have happened in other management areas. Uh, this work is only made possible by our incredible staff who put in so much hard work. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of the team that's been working really uh, hard together um, for Washington State to help tackle this green crab issue. So with that, I'll pass it back to Chelsea. Thanks, Lena. Um, hi again, once more, everyone. And I promise this will be short and sweet. This is gonna wrap it up. Um, if you're not currently involved with one, with one of our co-manager tribes or partners and still want to get involved, there are ways to do that, like I said earlier. First and foremost, you can always report suspected green crab to Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Lena kind of gave a brief uh, update on how to do that, but this can be done in a few different ways depending on how you like work, like to work with technology. You can report using the online reporting form. Um, you can email us, you can call us, you can use the Washington Invasive Species app by downloading that on your phone, and you can report several other species with that application as well. We do ask that if you report a green crab to include a location and photos front and back of the species is preferred so we can kind of sex it and also having a common item such as a penny in the photo for the size reference. You can also spread the word to others. We have all sorts of education and outreach materials available such as stickers and signs and flyers, wrap cards and ID cards. We even have multiple languages available for a few of our items and if you don't see one you need, please reach out to our communications team and we can work on making something available. I also just wanted to plug that a seventh grade European green crab mini unit plan will be coming available for students. So look out for that. And then last we have, as I said earlier, you can, if you want to get outside and get involved, you can join Washington Sea Grants Crab Team Monthly Monitoring Network or participate in the new molt search program. Unfortunately, at this time, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, we're not running a volunteer program, but we do work closely with all of our co-managers, tribes, and partners on standardizing training, supporting, obtaining appropriate permits, and much more. We're happy to forward along folks' interests as opportunities arise as well. And last but not least, here's a resource page for folks. I wanted to provide this for you all. Uh, we do have a cheat sheet online as well. There's three QR codes there. And I just want to point out that the WDFW European Green Crab webpage, as well as the Green Crab Hub, do have some overlap in uh, materials available. But I would suggest just taking a peek and checking it out. And one last plug before I pass it over to Maria is um, we are also going to be hiring for our communications uh, outreach specialist for European green crab. So that hiring will be taking place soon. So keep your eyes open for that job announcement once it goes live. Thank you very much for being here with us today. 
Maria. Thanks so much, Chelsea, and all presenters for that awesome presentation. I will now be moving into the Q&A. Uh, and if you have questions for the speakers that you haven't submitted yet, please feel free to do so. Um, there's quite a few. I'm going to read the ones that are open at the moment, and then we can maybe go through some of the ones that have already been answered if there's time. Um, so the first question I have is, would the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife be willing to hold town hall education series in fishing communities and others to educate fishermen and crabbers to help with the eradication? I'm looking at you, Justin, in case you wanted to speak to that. Sure. And for the rest of the speakers, go ahead and, and turn your cameras on and jump in if you want to take a question. Um, yeah, it certainly would be interested in doing that. Send an email to AIS as an aquatic invasive species at DFW is in Department of Fish and Wildlife. Dot law is in Washington. Dot GOV is in government and um, would be happy to to look at dates and figure that out. We certainly want to get the word out and we'll have that outreach specialist coming online pretty soon um, that, that may be able to join you there. All right, yes, and speaking of the outreach specialist and other job positions with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, Chelsea did drop the links in the chat. So someone asked about the applications for the European Green Crab Technicians. Those are in the chat for you. Um, so please look there for those links. And someone asked um, uh, what you're finding for average carapace size and percentage of greenish versus brownish abdomens. Yeah, so I can take that one. Um, thanks, John, for the question. Um, so it's a it's a good question that needs to be addressed. It's somewhat complicated by um, we're working towards having really unified data data standards for the state. Up until recently, it's been kind of like people will report the information they want. Um, so in some cases, people are putting out hundreds of traps. They're trying to do it quickly, and so we get some information like you know we caught X number of traps at roughly this locate or this many crabs at this location. But there wasn't specifics like how big they were, whether they were male or female. Whereas for efforts where we had a little bit more time and maybe it was less intense, that data would be collected. And so what needs to be done is one, I need to go through the data and filter out when we have that information and when we don't, so I could try to answer some of those questions. And then once we've got these standards kind of uniformly accepted by everyone who's involved, we should have more of that information going forward. So these are the the size one in particular is really helpful for determining um, things like cohorts and and new um, arrivals. I will say that the Washington Sea Grant Monitoring Program does collect all of that information, and so that's really useful. Um, and actually, that's all publicly available online if you want to see um, the results of their trapping efforts. That's on their. Um, uh, I always forget the name of the site. If you go to the Washington Sea Grant website, you can find it. But yeah. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, another question, what do you do with the trap crabs? Who to call with sightings? Yeah, so I would say the as it's already conveniently here, AAS at dfw.wa.gov, um, essentially what we're asking folks to do is just take good pictures of the animal and then release it. I know that it feels counterintuitive to release the animal when you're concerned that it's a green crab, but I will say that the majority of submissions that we get for green crab detections are false positives. So people will say it's a green crab, but it's actually a hairy shore crab or a hairy helmet crab or something like that. And I wanna be clear, we love getting those emails. One, because I like seeing pictures of crabs and two, because it means people are actually like looking and caring. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we're reluctant to, to have folks just go out and say like, go kill any green crabs you find because you know it, it can be tricky to learn to identify them consistently. And so it's a, an effort to try and protect our native species while still monitoring for green crabs. Um, so yeah, if you get it, take good pictures, email them to us and note where you found it. Um, so we can see if it's a new location, we definitely wanna go out and trap. If it's not, you know, we can, we, it's still useful information to have, so. Yeah, and this also partially answers a, a question um, that you typed an answer to Brian, but uh, we get this question a lot um, uh, about recreational crabbers being allowed to capture and eat them. Um, and, and Brian indicated, again, that we don't want to accidentally destroy native species, um, but there's also a low body size to meat ratio of the European green crab. And uh, on the East Coast, um, there hasn't been a lot of success in getting people to eat them there. Um, 
But Brian also noted that, you know, this doesn't mean that the policy will never change, but for now that that's the situation. Yeah, and our, right. East Coast, our East Coast folks are welcome to correct me if I'm wrong about the eating thing. My understanding is it's not been a great management tool, but that doesn't mean you can't make some delicious stock out of them or anything like that. They taste fine. So. All right. Someone's wondering if Squim Bay is a hot spot. I can take that one. Yeah. Uh, Squim Bay has, we've worked collaboratively with the Jamestown Skull and Tribe over the last several years. And there is a crab tea monitoring site there as well, the Jimmy Come Lately Creek. Um, it, I wouldn't call it a hot spot. I think it's a, a place of concern that we keep our eyes on and we work with the ecologists at the um, from Jamestown Skull and Tribe. And uh, we work, we do set traps periodically a few times a year. They they set traps there, but the numbers have been low um, in the last few years, but Discovery Bay nearby is a site where we have a higher concern and more numbers of green crab being pulled out. All right, um, someone asked any idea when the community outreach and education specialist position will be posted. I believe that was March. Um, and if you follow Department of Fish and Wildlife on social media, they will for sure be posting it. Uh, and I'll make sure that the council does as well. So definitely check out social media. And uh, you can also subscribe to receive alerts on the governmentjobs.com website um, for the agency. And so you can definitely watch that way as well. All right, let's see. The main mechanism for spread of the green crab through the Salish Sea is a natural spread or related to ballast water or other anthropogenic activities. Yeah, I can I can take that one. So to, to be 100% clear, it's not 100% certain. It's really hard to say how things move around. We have some genetic tracking stuff that's done that can kind of tell us roughly where things are from in a really, really, really broad scale. Um, the general assumption is that it's mostly going to be through um, natural larval spread, but that doesn't mean we aren't concerned about human movement. It's certainly possible to move them through aquaculture transfers. It's certainly possible to move them through ballast or biofouling or other issues like that. Uh, when it comes to things like aquaculture transfers and the like, it's required to go through permitting processes with the shellfish unit here at WW, and they review it um, to assess potential risks and things like that. Um, in terms of what the actual risk of ballast transport versus natural transport is in the Salish Sea, the short answer is we don't really know, um, but there are some efforts going on um, to try and actually figure that out. It's going to require some uh, mapping and understanding of current flows, as well as assessment of ballast water movements and things like that. So it's short answer, probably larval transport. Long answer, it's complicated, but we should be concerned that there is potential for human movement. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, question, where can we find the flyers? Hmm. Yeah, so I dropped the cheat sheet link in there. It's actually like a, a Chrome extension. So copy and paste that into the your header. Um, it's, I'll find a more direct link and put it in there. But if you go to the web page, the WDFW European Green Crab webpage, it should be under resources and you can find the different materials there. Thank you, Chase. I'll send that. Um, there were two questions that did get answered, but maybe other people are wondering, um, just with your collaboration with Canada, and it looks like you are in regular communication with them. Did anyone want to speak on that a little bit? Yeah, I can I can say some more stuff and then Justin can go next. Um, Perfect. We have worked collaboratively with, you know, the West Coast region for anywhere from California, Oregon, Alaska and Canada um, and several different co managers tribes partners, First Nations, and others that are involved in that region. Um, what we're learning here in Washington can be applied quite across the board. Uh, we're doing quite a bit here that people are taking note of, such as Alaska with their recent detections. And we've learned a lot from Canada as well. And so we do have the Salish Sea Transboundary Action Plan, um, where we can we, it, uh, it allows us to work more collaboratively with DF, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans um, and we always invite them to different meetings that we have, and we do meet regularly as well. So there are European Green Crab Research Task Force. So there's a lot of different avenues where we stay in close communication. Justin, do you have more to add to that? Just a little bit, and you covered it very well. Um, 
The, the other thing is that uh, we have an external coordinating group of all the different organizations um, with a role in Washington as well as beyond called the Multi-Agency Coordination Group, the MAC group, and Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada is part of that, maintaining common situational awareness. And then the other piece is that the, um, the Aquatic News and Species Federal Task Force is just completing a National European Green Crab Management Plan. And I think that's going to be a really great opportunity to bring all the different uh, West Coast jurisdictions together about the future. And um, in there is a recommendation for enhanced federal coordination and information sharing. And, and so really um, looking forward to that recommendation being fulfilled. Much like in Washington, each organization needs to contribute its portion to the overall success. And we're now looking for others to um, step up and, and help us work toward that common future. Brian, do you wanna talk about Oregon's management plan? Just very briefly. So um, Oregon is also developing a green crab management plan. Um, I'm in communications with folks down there because um, one big element that we want to ensure is that there is communication between uh, the various entities along the coast who are working with green crab. So Alaska, British Columbia, us, Oregon, California, um, everybody has different rules, um, as was mentioned in one of the questions that Oregon allows for the recreational keep of green crab. And I know that, you know, the, these differences in policy and, and practice and in actions and actions in different locations means we need to kind of all figure out what works and what we need to coordinate together. Um, just since it's it, it's so different from state to state and, and British Columbia too. Right. Thank you all. Uh, so we are at time and I wanted to make sure everyone has a chance to get their pesticide recertification credit from the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Here are the instructions uh, into the chat. I need your first name and then your last name and then your license number. And the code word or code phrase for today is five spines. Um, so please put that in the chat as well. And um, with that, thank you so much for joining us. A special thank you to all the speakers who volunteered their time today to share their knowledge and their work. It's really, really inspiring. So thank you all so much and happy Invasive Species Awareness Week. And we hope to see you in future webinars. Thanks, everyone.